nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Welcome to NanoHub U's first online course entitled The Fundamentals of Nanoelectronics. And as you know, the course is in two parts, each spread over five weeks. And there will be a separate video describing the administrative details. So what this is about is more to give you a feeling for the scientific content of this course. Now, as you know, this nanoelectronics, the nano in the nanoelectronics stands for nanometers. And just to remind you what that means, uh, it's like a billionth of a meter. So if you take a meter and go down by a factor of 1000, that gives you a millimeter. And we all know how much a millimeter is, you know, about that much. It's a thousandth of a meter. Now you go down another factor of 1000, that's a micrometer. And sometimes people call that a micron. And you go down yet another factor of a thousand, and that's a nanometer. And that actually gets you into almost atomic dimensions, in the sense the spacing between atoms is like, say, two tons of a nanometer. So what's that got to do with electronics? Well, in electronics, you see, for the last 40, 50 years, the industry has been driven by this process of miniaturization. Now, you probably heard of this Moore's law, that devices have been continually be getting smaller and smaller. And, of course, the reason is that way you can fit many more of these devices into a chip. So that every laptop you buy today has like over a billion transistors in it. And the reason you can fit a billion in there is because each one is extremely small. So again, just to give you an idea, what I have up here is a schematic of the, a very simplified schematic, I'd say, of a transistor. So what it consists of is a channel, what's called the channel, through which the electrons can flow. So that's the channel, I'll just write a C here. And across it, you put two contacts, which are usually called the source and the drain. And I'll just write this S and D. And these are large contacts across which you can connect a battery. That's this voltage. And of course, when you put a voltage, a current flows. And the ratio of voltage to current, that's called a resistance. Now you say, well, you didn't describe to me a transistor. What you did was just describe a resistor to me. Yes, that's true. A transistor has a third terminal, which I haven't shown because I don't want to clutter this up. What the third terminal does is it allows you to change that resistance, you know, by several orders of magnitude. Like, you could, the resistance could change by like a factor of 10,000 or so. So when it is high resistance, you would call that the off state. When it's a low resistance, you'd call that the on state. Okay. Now, this channel length, that is the length that electrons go from one contact to the other, now that's what, if you had looked back where things were, say 25 years ago, 1985, that channel length would be somewhere around here. And in those days, you could, you, you could fit far fewer transistors into a chip. I mean, nowhere near the billion that you can fit today. And the reason you can fit so many more today is because that channel length has gone down by a factor of 100 or so from 1985 to, I guess, 2010. It's gone down significantly. Okay. Now, what's not as well appreciated or not as well known is that in going down from this more than a micron to down here, you see, today's lengths are such that the length of the channel is only a few, like hundreds of atoms. And 
what is not as well known is that in going down, the entire nature of electron flow from one contact to another has changed significantly. In the sense that, you see, if you looked at what things, where things were in 25 years ago, the picture people had of how electrons go through a device would be something like this. It comes in, goes off in some direction, then hits something, turns around, goes in some other direction for a while, hits something, turns around again, and so on. So it eventually gets from source to drain, but not in a straight path, you know, it zigzags its way, like a random walk, I guess that's the technical name. Okay. Whereas today's devices are now small enough that electrons essentially go through like a bullet from one end to the other, almost. I mean, of course, the smaller the device is, the more correct this picture would be. And again, the technical name for that is ballistic transport. See? So this whole nature of transport has changed significantly then from what it was here, where you could call this diffusive transport, to where it is today, which you could call ballistic transport. Now, in terms of how we think about this, you see, that hasn't changed all that much. And the reason is that most people like me, of course, we learned about this whole field, about how current flows, how de devices work, in a top-down way. We learned about diffusive transport. And the reason is, of course, back in 1985, no one quite knew even how to think about resistance on this scale. In fact, that was one of the favorite things people argued about. You know, they would have discussions about, well, what would happen if you made a resistance resistor very short? And no one quite knew the answer. So it was like talking about the weather. You could talk forever, but not really, you know, that didn't get any clearer. And so what you do is usually all our freshman physics texts, the way you learn all this is top down. It's from the diffusive end. That is where everyone knew the answers. So you'd start from there. So typically in a freshman physics course, you'd learn that resistance is equal to resistivity times the length divided by the area. That's like, you might call it like Ohm's law, that if you make something longer, the resistance will be higher. If you make something shorter, it would be less. And the resistance also goes inversely as the cross section of the wire. So this is how you'd start. And from this point of view, you might say, well, if I made something really short, the resistance should just go to zero. And that's, that was the kind of things, you know, we one argued about back in the 80s. But what is now quite clear is that actually when you get to something really short, when you get to a ballistic conductor, the resistance actually does not go to zero, but it goes to a value given by this a fundamental constant. This is Planck's constant divided by the charge on an electron squared. H over Q square, and actually if you put in the numbers, that comes to about 25 kilo ohms. This times 1 over M, where M is an integer. So what is now clear experimentally, and people have seen this on many systems, semiconductors, metals, that the resistance of something really short is given by this quantum of resistance times one over M. So you say, well, okay, that's good for something really short, but that doesn't help me understand things that are long. And what we'll do in this course, I guess in the first couple of weeks, is what I'll try to show you is why, how in small conductors you have this result, but then if you go to long conductors, the resistance is just this times one plus length of the resistor divided by a mean free path. That's what I've written with this lambda. What's a mean free path? Well, as I said, in long devices, electrons go 
a little bit in one direction, then turn around, and then go a little bit. So mean free path is the typical length it goes before it gets turned around. So that's what appears here. So if you have a ballistic conductor, it means that the length is much less than the mean free path. And so you can drop this second thing here. So you can drop that. On the other hand, when you have a long conductor, you can drop the first term. And basically you then have Ohm's law. So this is this viewpoint, this whole new viewpoint, you see, which you would call the bottom-up view, where you start from something really short and then try to understand what happens when it's longer. This is what I'll try to convey in the first two weeks of this course. And then in the other three weeks that we are talking about the first part of the course, the subsequent three weeks we talk about three types of important devices. One is the nanotransistor, second is the whole new class of devices that's based on the spin of the electron, which I'll explain and we'll talk about. And thirdly, devices that are, that allow you to convert waste heat into electricity. And that again is another class of important devices of interest. But I should warn you that here, what we'll be talking about are more the basic concepts. If you really want to learn about those devices, you need to take separate courses from the experts. Like for example, in non, on nanotransistors, we are planning a course next semester from NanoHub U, from, which will be taught by Mark Lundstrom, who is an expert in the field. But what this course is really is more about the basic concepts, this concept of how you think about devices like small devices and how you can use that viewpoint even to understand big, longer devices. Now, you might say that, well, okay, so, we used to think of things top down and now we are going to talk about it bottom up. But is there any reason to think this is any simpler than the other? And that is where I'll try to explain why actually the bottom up view is a little simpler. But let, before I get onto that then, let me say a couple of words about the format of these presentations. These days usually of course presentations are made using PowerPoint. But my friends tell me that they like my blackboard lectures better. On the other hand, the problem with Blackboard lectures is at the end of it, you don't quite have a record of what happened. And so we have tried to find a happy medium between these two things. So what we have done is we have made our all these lectures in units of like 20 minutes or so, which we figured is, a, is an appropriate time anyway, because many of you are busy professionals and that's like your mean free time between important things that you have to attend to. So we try to make this like 20 minutes. And for each 20 minute section, we have one slide that summarizes what I'm talking about. It's sort of like if I were in your place listening to this lecture, the notes that I would have taken to go with. Now, of course, you are welcome to add to that, whatever notes you want to add to it. But that's this slide that's up, that's up there that you can look at, which summarizes it. And that way, We'll have a blackboard lecture, but you'll also have something that kind of gives you an idea of what it was we are talking about. And later on that you can refer to. And in, in a way, this module is actually a representative of kind of the kind of modules you would be listening to if you took this course. It, you know, it's about the same length, 20 minutes, and it's designed to give you a feeling for the modules that you'd be listening to, like six of them per week, if you were to take this course, one of these five-week courses. Okay. Now, the other point I want to mention is about prerequisites. That is, this course, we have tried to make it accessible to people from all branches of science and engineering. But I do assume a mathematical background that includes, you see, not just algebra and trigonometry, but also calculus and differential equations. And so in that sense, I think some of this material could also be taught to a pre-calculus audience, but it's something I've had no experience with. As far as this course is concerned, we do assume you know calculus and you're familiar with that. But what I do try to avoid is using jargon. Say, you know, specialized jargon. Just to give you an example, 
Anybody who works on electronic devices, has taken a course on it, would know what source and drain means. On the other hand, if you're a biologist, you probably don't know what that, I've never heard that word. So the point is, if I use the word source and drain, I'll try to make sure I explain what I mean by that first. So that's the kind of thing we have tried to do so that, you know, this is accessible no matter what your background is. Okay. Well, now back to the science then. As I said earlier, that when you use this viewpoint and you ask the question that when length goes to zero, what will be the resistance? Of course, you might say that, well, the resistance should go to zero. And what we have now seen is it does not go to zero. It actually goes to a different value and a sizable amount, sizable value. You know, it's like kilo ohms. Now, the one reason people find that somewhat disturbing is the following. That what is known is that any resistance is associated with a heat generation, I squared R. In fact, you know, that's how a light bulb works. You, it's basically a resistor. You run current through it. It gets hot. And once, once it gets hot enough, it emits light. That's how a light bulb would work. So any resistance is, a, is associated with a certain amount of heat generation. And the point that bothers people is the following, that if you see an electron is going straight from one contact to the other, then it's not exchanging energy with anything. So it's not giving up any heat in the sense that in a long device, what would happen is it would interact with its surroundings. So as it goes along, you know, the atoms would start jiggling. It would take some energy away from the electrons. And that's how the heat would be generated. And that is what it would be reflected as the resistance. So people generally say that, well, you know, in order to have a resistance, you must have some energy exchange. And so when you have ballistic transport, no energy exchange, it just goes straight from one side to the other. You cannot have any resistance. So this was one of the fundamental issues that, you know, caused a lot of debate and argument back in the 80s, you know, when the answers were not so clear. And what is now again experimentally quite clear is that in a ballistic conductor, what happens is when the electron goes straight through, it doesn't exchange any energy. So this part of it is like there is no heat generated, but all the heat is generated at the two ends. And this is what I've tried to show, I guess, in that picture with the red things that look like a, like a lightning. So that's the part that involves this heat exchange. And what is now believed, you know, experimentally also it's quite clear, is that in a very small device, much of the heat is actually generated in the contacts and not in the channel region. Now, this is actually a very fundamental point. You see, that makes it relatively easy to understand small devices compared to big devices. And the reason is, you see, the, when you look at how an electron gets from source to drain, you have this, this region where it does not exchange energy with the surroundings, that part of it. And then there is this, what I've denoted in red. And those are two totally different types of processes, you see. So that, so this black part, that's what you might call mechanics. And the red part, that's what you might call thermodynamics. So, and in physics, those were two totally separate branches of physics that developed independently. You see, mechanics developed back in with Newton, it started with Newton and much of that was developed in the context of understanding planetary motion, you know, where no friction is involved, see. And several centuries later, of course, heat engines came along, and then people understood that heat was a form of energy too, but it's a random form of energy, and there's an associated very diff difficult concept of entropy. You know, that's again one of those jargon that you may have heard of, but if you have not, don't worry about it. But the point is that there are these then two types of processes. Processes that are 
described by Newton's law. That's this Newton's law. And processes that are that involve exchange of entropy, as I said, but basically it is about heat generation. So that's what I'll denote with this kind of thing. And in order to understand devices, usually you need both of those. See? And what happened in the 19th century was Boltzmann, I think whose picture you can see up there, he showed how you could combine Newton's laws with thermodynamics and this create in statistical mechanics and created this Boltzmann equation, which was highly controversial in its day and even now excites a lot of debate. But that is what you really need if you want to describe devices. See? And this whole field, you see, it's called, you see, it's statistical mechanics, and it's like non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, which, which is what you need. And that sounds like a fairly difficult subject, and you might wonder, well, am I going to learn all that in five weeks? Answer is no, of course not. You still have to go back and take courses on thermodynamics if you want to learn that well. But what we'll try to show you is how all this fits into our understanding of devices, see? And what allows me to do a lot of this in a relatively simple way is because in small devices, those two things, the mechanics and the thermodynamics are well separated. So the mechanics is in the channel, the thermodynamics is in the contacts. And because it's in the contacts, nicely separated, you see what I can do is you'll see just in the first two weeks, we'll take care of it in a very elementary way. In fact, so elementary, you may not even realize you are doing anything profound, unless I pointed it out, see? So that's what kind of allows us to make this relatively simple. And the second part of the course is kind of a quantum version of this. You see, Boltzmann died, I think, around 1906, little before quantum mechanics came along. And when quantum mechanics came along, of course, Newton gets replaced by Schrodinger equation. But you still have to include these entropic processes like I mentioned, and when you add those two things, you get this non-equilibrium green function method. You see, that widely used to analyze quantum devices. And that's kind of what we'll talk about in the second part of the course. But here too, when you take this course, it doesn't mean that you don't have to take any course on quantum mechanics. Absolutely not. But what it will do is hopefully give you a feeling for how all this fits in, the overall pattern, kind of like your front web page, you see, where you have lots of things. You have Boltzmann, you have Schrodinger, you can, all these links, and you could follow up on them and go a lot further if you want. In fact, what I hope is some of you will actually be intrigued enough that you'd want to learn a lot more about all this, see? But even if you don't, I think at least what you, I hope you'll enjoy is a different view of this whole very complicated subject by view that is made possible by the modern developments in nanoelectronics, whereby this mechanics and thermodynamics can be effectively separated and which gives you a very clear view of many of these phenomena. And what I hope is that is something you'll enjoy seeing anyway. In fact, my colleagues and I, we believe that it's not just nanoelectronics. It's, this is something you'll see more and more of generally in the fields of nanoscience and nanotechnology. And to some extent, that's the kind of theme that we expect our courses, later courses to be offered by NanoHub U will sort of revolve around. Well, thank you and welcome to this first online course of NanoHub U.